A few months ago, I made a video where I argued that the best telescope for visual applications is the Dobsonian telescope. Well, in today's video, I'm going to focus on another telescope design, the refractor, highlighting its design features, strengths and weaknesses. I will also try to make a case for why I think that it's the best overall telescope design with respect to image quality, both for visual and astrophotography applications. So without further ado, let's get this video on the road. Hi, I'm Bogdan Damian and welcome to Video Observatory. The story of the refractor telescope begins in the early 17th century, when Dutch eyeglass maker Hans Lippershey crafted the first telescope, a spyglass with a convex objective lens and a concave eyepiece. This invention, initially designed for terrestrial use, paved the way for astronomers like Galileo Galilei to turn their gaze skyward. His observations of Jupiter's moons, the phases of Venus and the craters on the moon laid the foundation for a new era of celestial exploration. Chromatic aberrations, the tendency of lenses to focus different colors of light at different distances, causing color fringing and reducing image sharpness, was a significant issue in early telescopes. In the mid-17th century, another Dutch scientist, this time Christian Huygens, introduced the concept of using a combination of convex and concave lenses to correct this problem, leading to the development of achromatic lenses. From then on, the achromatic refractor took the world of astronomy by storm, becoming the most popular telescope design for amateur and professional astronomers. That is, until the middle of the last century, when the reflecting telescope took its place as the most popular instrument for observing the night sky with. This being said, there are two main types of refractor designs that are currently available on the market today. The achromatic and the apochromatic design. As I'm sure you already know, a refractor uses lenses to bend and focus the incoming light. To achieve this, all the refractor designs employ a lens at the front of the optical tube called the objective. Now, depending on how many lens elements the objective is made of and the quality of the glass used, determines the type of the refractor telescope. Achromatic refractors use a combination of two lens elements in an effort to reduce chromatic aberrations. To achieve this, their lenses are made out of different types of glass with varying dispersion properties. These type of refractors are also called doublet refractors and represent the most affordable and therefore popular type of refracting telescopes. To improve the quality of the views even further, manufacturers started adding additional lens elements to the objective, thus creating the apochromatic design. By employing a third element design, where each element features different optical properties, a triplet refractor is able to correct the incoming light even further. This change in design allows the different wavelengths of light to be focused precisely in the same spot, leading to color aberration-free views. But how exactly does one measure the ability of a refractor telescope to produce views without color fringing? Well, there are a couple of definitions out there that tell us about the quality of the lens elements in a refractor telescope. To better understand this, we need to go back in time. In 1868, Ernst Abbe, the head of the Zeiss company, developed a truly color-free lens made out of multiple elements, designed to work in a microscope. He also established what, in his opinion, an apochromatic lens must do to earn its name. And this sort of became an unofficial standard for apochromatic telescopes. First, master chromatic dispersion, meaning that the objective should bring the three primary colors, red, green and blue, 
into focus at the same point, minimizing or eliminating chromatic aberrations across the whole visible spectrum. A telescope's ability to perform in this category is reflected in the Aben number. It is used to quantify the dispersion of a transparent material such as glass and is defined as the ratio of the difference in refractive indices to the mean dispersion. The higher the number, the lower the dispersion is and the better the light gets corrected. The second criteria an apochromatic lens needs to fulfill refers to spherical aberrations and distortion, as this aspect has a significant impact on image quality and sharpness. It is characterized by the AB sign condition, which is a criterion for minimizing two important optical aberrations, spherical and comma. It states that the product of the refractive index and the sign of the angle of incidence in one medium must be equal to the product of the refractive index and the sign of the angle of refraction in the other medium. So what do these two principles mean for an actual refractor telescope? Well, it means that to satisfy the first condition, usually a third lens element needs to be added to an achromatic design. This solves the color correction issue. To ensure that the second principle is satisfied as well, a fourth lens is oftentimes needed, elevating the design of a triplet to a quadruplet configuration that has the capability to eliminate spherical and comma aberrations as well. It is important to note here that adding a field corrector or flattener between a triplet telescope and the eyepiece serves the same purpose, leading to basically the same results as a quadruplet telescope design. With respect to the first point, the chromatic dispersion, there are a few standards out there that tell us how good a lens is at eliminating false coloring. For example, the German company Schott AG defined the SFPL types of glass, where S stands for Schott, F for fluoride, P for lead, chemically PB, and L for low dispersion. Why fluoride? Well, because it has a much lower dispersion capability compared to traditional optical glass. This means that when light passes through a lens with a high fluoride content, the different colors of light are bent less, allowing them to come to a more precise focus. But if this is the case, why not make all refractor lenses out of fluoride crystals? Well, because fluoride is very brittle and hard to process, which is why it is rather added to an existing sand mixture for creating glass instead. Alright, so starting from low to high quality glass, you have the normal shot glass with an AB number of around 65, followed by the low dispersion version SFPL51 51, with an AB number of 81.5, better still is the standard SFPL53 with an AB number of 94.9. This last type of glass would be used in your typical apochromatic refractor. There are also other categories as well, like the SFPL55, but these offer only a marginal improvement over the SFPL53 and aren't nearly as popular as the ones above, with only very few telescopes using them. Okay. But how to put all this into context when deciding to get a new refractor telescope? Well, at the low end of the spectrum, you have affordable achromatic refractors, which typically feature an objective made out of two normal glass elements. If you are considering such a telescope, my recommendation would be to get one with a focal ratio of f9 or slower. This is because the longer the focal length is, the better the light can be corrected by the standard lenses. Telescopes in this category are rather suited for visual observations than for astrophotography. A good example of a simple and inexpensive refractor with a good optical performance is the 90mm f10 EVO star from Skywatcher. Thanks to the long focal length, 
the objective is able to decently correct the light even if it doesn't feature a low dispersion glass element. I have reviewed this telescope a while back and to this day it is still my go-to recommendation for anyone who is looking to start with astronomy. Good mid-range achromatic telescopes are the ones that feature one normal and one low dispersion or ED glass element. These telescopes can deliver a much better color correction even at medium focal lengths between f7 and f9. Refractors in this category are not only excellent for visual observations, but they start to make decent instruments for astrophotography as well. My recommendation here is to look for ED refractors with an SFPL 51 or 53 lens element. So good examples would be on one hand the 4 inch F7 SV503 doublet from Sviboni, which features an SFPL 51 glass element. On the other hand, you have the a bit more expensive 4 inch F9 Evo Star doublet from Skywatcher, which features an FPL 53 glass element by O'Hara. The longer focal length combined with the better corrected objective lens is capable of elevating the image quality even further. But if you are after the best corrected image possible, then look at refractors with 3 or 4 lens elements made to FPL 53 standards. These will provide excellent chromatic and spherical aberration correction even in fast focal ratios. Such high quality apochromatic refractors are primarily used for astrophotography applications thanks to the top of the line optical elements inside. A good example here would be the f5.9 91mm floor star triplet from William Optics with its excellent FPL 53 lens element also by O'Hara. Sporting one additional ED lens element for correcting spherical aberrations is the 107mm f6.9 PHQ from Ascar. Both these telescopes are capable of delivering near perfect color correction and very low spherical aberrations. But why get a refractor in the first place and not a Newtonian reflector or a catadioptric telescope? Well, as we saw earlier, the biggest downside of a refractor telescope is its susceptibility to chromatic and spherical aberrations. The bigger the lenses get and the shorter the focal length becomes, the more and better corrected glass needs to be fitted inside so that the telescope can maintain a certain level of image quality. And this of course will drive not only the weight and size up but also the price. For example, if you are shopping for a top of the line, do it all 6 inch apochromatic refractor like the 150mm Takahashi TOA, you are easily looking at a 5 figures price tag and weight north of 15 kilograms just for the OTA alone. By comparison, even an entry level Newtonian reflector won't display any chromatic aberrations whatsoever, provided the eyepieces used are high quality. But where reflectors lack any false coloring, they suffer from coma due to the curvature of the primary mirror, as well as from sharpness and contrast issues due to diffraction caused by the central obstruction created by the secondary mirror. And these problems become more and more visible the faster the focal ratio of the reflector is. While you can almost completely get rid of chromatic and spherical aberrations in a refractor by adding a third and fourth correcting lens to the objective, you won't be able to completely remove coma and diffraction aberrations in a reflector even with the use of premium coma correctors like the Paracord Type 2 from Teleview. In turn, thanks to their design, much wider apertures are possible with reflectors and this will allow for considerably higher light gathering capacities and resolutions when compared to refractors. But ultimately, while you can go big, really big size-wise with a Newtonian reflector, arguably you won't be able to reach the sharpness and contrast levels of a quality apochromatic refractor.
A good compromise between the two already mentioned categories are catadioptric telescopes, more precisely the Maxut of Cassegrain design. In my opinion, it's the only widely available telescope type that can match the image quality of an apochromatic telescope. This is because, in contrast to other reflector and catadioptric telescopes, a MAC features, just like a reflector, an objective lens at the front of the optical tube. This objective is also called the meniscus lens and its job is to, well, correct the light that enters the telescope before it hits the primary mirror. This single lens is designed to correct coma, normally introduced by the concave primary mirror. However, even with eliminating coma altogether, a MAC, just like any reflector design features a central obstruction thanks to the secondary reflective surface and this will always lead to a reduction in contrast and sharpness due to diffraction. Penalties a premium refractor telescope simply doesn't suffer from. On the other hand, a MAC is however much more compact and can reach wider aperture more easily before it becomes too expensive to be a realistic option for the average hobby astronomer. So in the beginning of this video I stated that the refractor is the best telescope design and while I'm sticking with it, to be fair and objective I need to specify this further. I do believe it's the best design, but only if I'm specifically looking at image quality in terms of contrast, sharpness and lack of optical aberrations. But like with any other instruments, there are of course shortcomings with the refractor as well, such as price, size and weight for the relatively small aperture that it offers. This small aperture also makes observations of fainter DSOs somewhat difficult, whereas a reflector is unbeatable in this category. It's also much, much more affordable if you look at the price per inch of aperture. Anyway, that's been it for now. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think about refractor telescopes in the comments below. Do you agree with me or do you see things differently? I'm very interested in reading your opinions. As this is going to be my last video of the year, I would like to wish you happy holidays and a happy new year alongside your families and loved ones. Thanks for watching and catch you guys in the next one.